Hi, I'm Donna Ottaviano Britt with the Diocese of Camden, and I am gathered here tonight with several guests. And this is a celebration of the feast day of St. Juan Diego, which occurs this week, just a few days in front of the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So we're going to spend some time talking about St. Juan Diego, his connection to Our Lady, and we're going to celebrate it over this beautiful feast, which we're going to talk about. But first, I'd like to introduce who's going to share in this dinner conversation tonight. So to my immediate left is... Star from Keeping a Catholic. Okay. <laughs> hey, everyone. This is Jose, Director of Youth, Young Adults and Campus Ministry for the Diocese of Camden and Star's Sidekick. Yep. Hi, I'm Father Adam Jehetsky. I'm the Vocation Director for our Diocese and the host of What a Life. So great to be here. Well, this is a pleasure to be here and actually to celebrate this saint in such a meaningful way. But before we begin our discussion, and before we begin to eat, we're going to have grace. So, Father Adam. So let's start in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all the great gifts in our lives, the gift of our friends, the gift of our families, the gift of our faith. Lord, we ask through the intercession of St. Juan Diego that we may continue to grow as your disciples and spread your love to everyone that we meet. And we pray for those who go without this day as we pray together. Bless us, O Lord, in Indeed, these thy gifts which we are about, about to receive from, from thy bounty through, through Christ, Christ our Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. So maybe what we could do is talk about all this lovely food that's on the table first before we start the conversation. So Star and Jose, first I will say this was actually Jose's idea. <laughs> so I like we, to eat. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we would celebrate St. Juan Diego over food uh, that is from Mexico. So Star did a lot of the cooking. So but so why don't the two of you kind of share this beautiful spread that's on the table with everyone? Please. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're having um, tacos or their potato tacos. Um, we're having refried beans, carnitas, um, the cabbage goes over the tacos, and some Mexican rice. Excellent. Yeah. So, so a little simple. See how that was very not specific. I mean, do you anything? want me to go into <laughs> details? <laughs> so the carnitas is <laughs> pork, okay, that's slowly cooked in, for hours and hours and hours. Uh, the taquitos, like Star said, is a corn tortilla, and then on the inside you have queso fresco and potatoes, mm -hmm. which will be dressed with cabbage. We have some sour cream. Here we have red salsa, green salsa. In our small pitcher here, we have hibiscus water or agua de Jamaica. Uh, over here we have, in front of Father, the queso fresco with some chile serranos. And in this little bundle of joy, we have blue corn tortillas. Um, and I think that's it. All right, so we're going to have quite a feast while we talk about St. Juan Diego and Our Lady of Guadalupe. So we're going to get started and kind of fill our plates and we're going to talk. Mm -hmm. So as we engage in having this really beautiful meal that Star has gone to great trouble to make for it's us. It's not going to be the theme of the I thought you would be able to share with everyone who's joined us around what you say about what we're eating versus maybe what St. Juan Diego probably ate. So I don't think Juan Diego would have eaten something like this. I think maybe he would have eaten, been eating something more humble. Um, however, I do think that the corn in this meal, as far as the corn tortillas, definitely plays like a major role. Only because um, back, then, back then the indigenous people in incorporated corn in any way that they could. So um, I definitely think that that's a huge role. Um, and obviously the rice and the beans is something that they would have harvested, harvested as well. So yeah, I think it's I think it's simple, but it's not too simple either. So it's, right. it's a great way to acknowledge, you know. How important he is through this meal. Mm -hmm. And you also touched on something which I thought was really important is, and God often through all of mm -hmm. his history and his relationship with with humankind has always chosen the humble. Yeah. Has always chosen yeah. the humble. Always. So I thought that was a beautiful yeah. reference. It to is. Him. It's always it's always beautiful to see 
how God chooses people. And it, you don't have to be anybody magnificent or spectacular. You could just be you, and he, he loves us that way. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a really nice way to think of how God is a father God mm -hmm. and how he chose St. Juan Diego. Yeah. And how actually Our Lady did, and we'll get to that. Definitely. So in an effort that everyone can come to really understand St. Juan Diego and his interaction with Our Lady, Father Adam, actually is in a really good position to share the story of St. Juan Diego and why he was actually there in Mexico. So Father Adam, would you share? Definitely. Thanks, Don. And uh, Juan Diego is, is someone I really have a great devotion to. And it started uh, when I was in the college seminary. And uh, just to learn about this great humility, as you guys talked about, this humble man. Um, and we know that he was born around 1474. Uh, so he was raised in the Aztec religion. He was someone who you know, would be considered a pagan. So he spoke uh, Nahuatl or Nahuatl, um, depending on, on how you say. Um, and I'll butcher a lot of these names, so hopefully Star and Jose will be able to fix them <laughs> for me. Um, but Juan Diego had an Indian name, which meant he who speaks to the eagles. And, uh, you know, this will come into play later on. So as Juan Diego is growing up, he's growing up in the Aztec religion. And uh, he lives, of course, with his family. Um, but his father dies at a very early age, so he begins to be raised by his uncle. And as Juan Diego grows, he gets married, and all this really has a, an important part to play later on. So he marries a woman, and they live with his uncle. And as uh, the world continues to change, the Spanish conquistadors would eventually arrive to Mexico. Um, so around the year 1520, 1521, um, but Juan Diego would have a great experience of all these things over uh, that he would be able to experience everything that happened through the, the Aztec religion. And this is, uh, again, something that will come into play later on. Um, so as the uh, conquistadors come in, um, it changes everything. So Juan Diego really sees everything that happens as, um, you know, the, the Aztec religion really is overthrown. And before we know it, that the Christian religion comes into play. And um, this is something that changed the face of Mexico and changed the face of Latin America. Um, and Juan Diego was one of the first really converts as uh, after the first conquistadors come in, Spain was really divided, or Mexico was really divided uh, up between different religious orders that were coming in, the Franciscans, the Augustinians, the Dominicans, and I think the Jesuits were the ones where they really had divided you know, Mexico up into who would take which territory. And uh, Juan Diego's section would be uh, evangelized by the Franciscans. And uh, you know, Juan Diego really had experienced a lot of uh, really the culture of death as he experienced the, the life of uh, the Aztec, but also he saw the, the invasion of the conquistadors. And, you know, the, the conquistadors brought a lot of things with them, including our faith, but also a lot of bad things that happened. Um, but thankfully, Juan Diego and his wife would be converted to the Catholic faith and uh, would eventually um, continue to, to practice as the religion would really take hold and the diocese of um, Mexico City, I think, would be established and um, they would get a bishop. Bishop, uh, is it Zumarraga? Mm -hmm. Zumarga? Zumarraga. Zumarraga, uh, who was a Franciscan, a Spaniard. And uh, he would, you know, do a lot of great things for the community, build hospitals and schools, um, was a, a really good influence in the community. But St. Juan Diego, as we go back to his story, has such an a impressive story because he would have to walk about 15 miles or so to get to Mass. And really, that's where our story picks up. As back in the old calendar, they used to celebrate the Immaculate Conception on December 9th. So Juan Diego was walking to church that day. He was walking to celebrate this feast of the Immaculate Conception. Now, at this time, he had been widowed, so he was about... Uh, it was 1531, so about, uh, what's that, 57 or so? You know, he's a, an older man, like uh, Mike Walsh. And um, he uh, is, was making his way to church when uh, all of a sudden he hears this beautiful music playing. And he hears somebody calling out his name, Juanito, Juan Dieguito. And uh, Juanito, as we know, is, is uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, not a diminutive, but a, it's like a it's an apodo or a nickname. A nickname, a nickname. So, yeah. um, and that's you know just a, a one that like a parent or somebody mm -hmm. who loves you would call you um, Juanito. So little Juan, um, 
like uh, is that Estrellita, right? Is is your little which star. is a yeah. beautiful name, a little star, um, and that's something again that's done with love, um, and something done um, from family, people that know you. Um, so this is you know something that kind of shocks me. Not only that, it's in this original uh, Nahuatl or Nahuatl language, um, which is even more surprising to him. So he hears all this and he walks up this mountain that he's about to pass, and there's he, he sees a young girl, and uh, you know, she tells him that she has a great mission for him, that uh, she wants him to build a chapel right there on this hill so that all those who are crying, who are suffering, who are struggling can come uh, to talk to her, can t- come to uh, give her prob- give their problems over to her. And uh, Juan Diego doesn't know what's going on. He, he's, he's kind of uh, uh, mesmerized by what he sees and what he finds and uh, eventually asks her name and... Uh, you know, he's, she says, um, uh, what does she say? The, uh, I am your, no, no, that's later on, that's but later I forget, on. uh, what she says. Oh, that's what it is. It's the, uh, it's the Nawap word for the, the one who crushes the head of the serpent. Yeah. It's like a weird, but it sounds like Guadalupe. And, uh, so this is something that he remembers and he goes to this bishop, uh, Zumaraga. Uh, now, we also got to kind of put in mind that the indigenous, and Juan Diego was part of the indigenous, was someone who kind of were looked down upon. And, uh, you know, it was a, a tough time for them as, you know, there was a, a famous uh, priest, uh, Bartolome de las Casas, who was arguing that, you know, the indigenous were able to um, take on the faith, that the, we're, you know, were in fact equal to, to human beings, which is, you know, surprising. Um, so as Juan Diego comes up to this bishop, um, he tells him exactly what the Blessed Mother said. And the Blessed Mother was speaking his dialect, was speaking his language. And um, the bishop, you know, takes in what he says and says, I really have to pray about it and kind of dismisses him um, from that mission. So Juan Diego kind of is, is downcast and walks back very sad um, by the things that he has heard and thinks that he really failed the Blessed Mother. So this is all happening on December 9th. As he's making his way back, the Blessed Mother appears to him again. And he tells her, you know, you've chosen the wrong guy. You've chosen the wrong person for this mission. Um, You know, I'm just a humble and simple man. And uh, Mary tells him, no, I've chosen the right guy. You're going to go back uh, tomorrow and ask again for this uh, chapel to be built. So one day he goes home. Next day he goes back and talks to the bishop. Uh, And again, the bishop is kind of, you know, uh, a little bit tougher to get in touch with because he kind of thinks that this guy is just crazy and doesn't really want to speak to him. But eventually Juan Diego knows that he's on an important mission from the Blessed Mother and that he needs to talk to him. Um, so this time the bishop takes it all in and he goes, all right, if this is really true, then I ask you to, to give me a miracle, to show me something that proves this. So Juan Diego goes back and now he tells the Blessed Mother, well, we have to show him something um, so that he'll believe us. Uh, and the Blessed Mother says, all right, we'll come back tomorrow and we'll give him his miracle. We'll give him his sign. So this is right now December 10th. So Juan Diego goes back uh, to his uncle, uh, but he finds that his uncle is deathly ill and is probably going to die within the next day or two. Um, and ends up spending the whole day taking care of him. Ends up spending the whole day, you know, making sure that he's all right and then trying to find a priest to give him the, the last rites. So the whole day, he never goes to see the Blessed Mother. Um, and it's the next day when he's leaving that he knows that he he did, you know, something that the Blessed Mother was asking him to do that he, he didn't fulfill it, that he didn't come back. So he decides to take the long way around the mountain, thinking that he would avoid her, thinking that he would um, not run into her. But she appears to him again, you know, and he's very kind of even more anxious. And he explains what was happening, that um, his uncle was sick and that he needed to care for him. Um, and that's when she has her famous line. Uh, am I not here? Am I not your mother? And uh, this is something that we really hold on to. And this is something, um, you know, that it, it sounds better in Spanish, I think. So Jose will be able to to uh, to relay it more. Um, but it's just a, a beautiful, you know, conversation that they have. Uh, so she tells Juan Diego to go up to the mountain um, and to pick the flowers that he finds. And as Juan Diego goes up into this barren hill, he finds these uh, Castilian uh, roses, which weren't native to Mexico, and especially in December, uh, weren't going to be growing. So he picks all these roses, and he brings them back to the Blessed Mother, and she arranges them. 
Um, and as they're being uh, arranged, you know, they're folded up in a tilma, which would be kind of like this. Mm -hmm. um, so he's got them held up. He doesn't really see what's going on. And she says, bring this to the bishop. So he brings it to the bishop. And he, as soon as he walks into the room, he unfolds it. And behold, there's this miraculous image that we now know as Our Lady of Guadalupe. And it's uh, a, a beautiful image. And it's there's so much that goes into it. We could really do a whole show on the image of everything mm -hmm. that goes in it. And, mm -hmm. you know, especially the, the eyes where the, you actually get a, a reflection of the whole room. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the miracle. And, and the bishop kind of under, understands now. Um, and this tilma was a regular tilma. It wasn't anything special. It was something made of like cactus fiber and something that yep. would have disintegrated over time. But, uh, you know, it's been there since 1531 and still going strong. So, you know, it's, it's something that's been celebrated and something that's, we're, we're blessed to have so i was able to see it when i was studying in mexico and just seeing uh the great devotion of the mexican people and uh now whenever i go anywhere you know that's where i learned all my spanish so i always tell them uh, soy mexicano you know? <laughs> I, I i look like a gringo but my heart is 100 percent mexican so i really just fell in love with the culture and uh, i was blessed to study there twice um and once i got to see um the shrine of our lady of guadalupe i got to see the basilica um but also got to see the great devotion of the people. And that was really something that touched my heart. And, um, you know, Juan Diego was just a, a humble man who trusted. And, uh, you know, it's, it's surprising because after that, the Blessed Mother would appear to young children. Mm -hmm. um, and Juan Diego was one of the last, you know, adults that she would ever appear to. And uh, he would go on to live a very quiet life, like m most of the... Uh, people do that do see the blessed mother like saint bernadette or saint lucia where they kind of sequester themselves away some in convents but juan diego lived in a hermitage right on um tepeyac hill where he was able to kind of live out his days because he would become pretty famous over that time um but just juan diego's life is one of, of simplicity and it's one i think that's just a great example for us that god chooses us and he finds us where we are and that he works with us and Juan Diego was one who really had some some probably tough experiences and challenges, mm -hmm. but through all that, he had a great devotion to the Blessed Mother and um, to our Lord, and uh, that changed his life. But then he changed the world. So this man who stumbled or started out in humble origins really set the world on fire with Our Lady Guadalupe as more we're able to convert and, and to change the world. Thank you, Father Adam, for sharing such a beautiful story and sharing with us not only the story of, of St. Juan Diego, but your story of being in Mexico and studying there and that your heart really is with the Mexican people. So beautiful stories because stories matter to people and these are the things that touch the lives of other people. So what I'd like to do is, is kind of turn my attention to Jose now and kind of you first, but then you and Star together. Kind of where did your devotion to Our Lady of Guadalupe come from? I know you have images here in your house of her. I can see her. I can, we have St. Juan Diego right here on the table. So maybe share with us a little bit around how your devotion to Our Lady started. Um, it was actually, it was actually kind of like passed on to me or I picked it up um, in the parish. Um, every year, um, the Mexican community of our parish puts together this amazing celebration and it, it's contagious, right? The love, the devotion, the passion that they have to give of themselves and offer these beautiful flowers and these songs and dance. And it's like the ultimate veneration. And it's contagious. I mean, you can't help but be moved. Every year we go to the Mañanitas, which is, um, they kind of put on like a mini concert, right? Mm -hmm. And you have groups come from all over. Um, and they just sing songs. They sing songs to her. They sing songs about her. Uh, and then there's the Mass. And then the next day, which is the feast day, you go and 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 the church is is packed and, and and everybody's there and everybody's there to celebrate the same thing um and it's to celebrate her and what she did and and how she reminds us um you know 
like Father Adam had said earlier, you know, no estoy yo aquí que soy tu madre. Am I not here who am your mother? And how does that not resound with you? Mm -hmm. You know, she didn't say, you know, am I not here um, specifically for the Mexican community? Or am I not here for specifically Juan B? Like, am I not here who am your mother? And that that's, you can't help but walk away from that celebration saying, you know what? You're right. And that spoke to me and, and, and it has, and it, and it continues to do so. I know we've had conversations at the office, Donna, where it's like, even now more than ever, that, that, that one liner, right. It's like a, that right for the heart. Am I not here? Who, who are your mother? And it's like a million of things are going on. So many concerns, so many distractions from everything. And then that, that one liner hits you again. And it's like, all right. You're right, blessed mother. You're there. You're the person that I need to inter um, be my intercessor to your son. And I continue to walk with her on a daily basis. But, I mean, it really, I'm I'm blessed for the community that we have at our parish, um, for the community that we have here in South Jersey, mm -hmm. where you could go anywhere on this feast day and be moved by the celebrations. Um, so it really is, I think it's, it's, it's a people, it's a, it's a connection, a spiritual connection between people and between communities. Mm -hmm. I love, I love the celebrations at our parish and, and I'm sure there's other, there's other parishes that do the same thing, but, um, in the offertory, they, they, um, they mentioned, so I remember it, it, when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico and it was devastating for my friends and my family who live in Puerto Rico. Um, and we were at the mass and there was part of the offertory. They, they brought up a Puerto Rican flag in the offertory. So this was a mass for the Mexican community to kind of shine and let's pray for Mexico. And, but they took the, the time to pray for the people of Puerto Rico. And I remember my heart just like fell out of my chest and I, crying because it was like that's what this is about like we're just we're celebrating and we're venerating our mother our mother um and you can't help i mean even on the island there's a number of parishes that are devout to our lady of guadalupe named after her um you know in every household there's an image so it's more than a cultural thing it's it's it really is a spiritual connection to my brothers and sisters through her so it's great yeah, it really is. Mm -hmm. And so this is this whole idea of celebrating St. Juan Diego on his feast day and connecting it to our, the feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe was a conversation that you and I had started having in the yeah. office. And really, it comes out of co multiple conversations with se several people in the diocese around what are, what are some of the things that we can actually do in Advent to celebrate this season? And so though St. Juan Diego is not particularly tied necessarily to Advent, he is to Our Lady. Mm -hmm. And this whole period of Advent is a chance to actually travel with Our Lady because even in this same week, we have St. Juan Diego and Our Lady of Guadalupe. We also have the Feast of the Immaculate Conception that's right. going to happen in the same week. So, so let me shift to you, Star, a little bit and sharing you know, what your relationship is actually like with Our Lady. So by default, it was handed down to me because of my culture. I'm half Mexican, so that was passed down to me in that way. Um, but for me, I I really have a deep connection with Guadalupe because my grandma in Mexico, who still lives there, has a very very deep connection with her. I mean, every you could every every day, seven o'clock, faithfully, she's praying her rosary. She has frames everywhere and every I just remember every time going to see her seeing frames of her and of Jesus and you know always just saying like I I love you or like you know when she's having like a tough time she's you know she just has that such that devotion to her mm -hmm. and um you know in my family obviously my parents and my father have that devotion to her as well but also I do have to piggyback off of what Jose said it didn't really kind of hit home for me until the parish started doing a lot of the feast days for her or the feast day for her for Our Lady of Guadalupe. And, um, you know, just seeing 
everybody so happy and connected. It kind of, for me, it's that moment that I get to connect with my family in Mexico that's not here. It's a moment for me to have that connection with them. Whether, even though they're not here, we're still connected in that way through our lady. And it's just very nostalgic for me every time and for my dad as well. So yeah, that's how I connect it. Yeah, it's really wonderful. So your connection, Father Adam, and yours, Jose, and your star, mm-hmm. and mine, we have a great love for Our Lady of Guadalupe in our house. We have a big image of her. Mm-hmm. Well, in our front picture window. She's nearly three feet tall. She's Whoa. painted oh beautifully. She's painted beautifully. She weighs 100 pounds, so I can't really carry her around. <laughs> She's made out of concrete, so <laughs> we can't really take her many places. But we've actually heard from our neighbors because we, we actually had lights installed, so she's lit up at nighttime. Our neighbors love to see her. Wow. That's great. That's awesome. You know, so, and it's just a way to kind of make our mother present, mm-hmm. you know, to other people. And she is the... Um, um, uh, what's the right phrase for the Americas? Right? The patroness, the patroness right, of the yeah. Americas. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, really, could not be a more lovely image of Our Lady, and, and all of the images of Our Lady are so beautiful. Mm-hmm. But I think the this connection and this whole idea of sort of bringing Saint Juan Diego to life was really important for us, because what I would say about him is. He might get a little bit short shrift, Mm -hmm. you know, because Mm -hmm. he comes on the 9th and Our Lady of Guadalupe is celebrated in a very big way, as you've just uh, talked about on the 12th. But as every saint, I think, would say, I would much rather. I would much rather that it be Our Lady and have nothing to do with me in his great humility. Mm -hmm. So thank you. So now we are having dessert and courtesy of Mike Walsh, because he has to get some credit in here. We have a deconstructed, (laughs) right? What did he call it? This is a deconstructed deconstructed Mexican Mexican wedding 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 cookie. And obviously it should have a very different shape than this. (laughs) I think it's supposed to be round, but it's flat, but I'm sure it's good. And then we have chocolate tort. Mexican chocolate tort. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to enjoy these while we continue our conversation around St. Juan Diego and Our Lady of Guadalupe. What we're going to talk about first, though, is some of the images that are embedded in Our Lady of Guadalupe's image. So let's talk a little bit around kind of what maybe resonates with you. Father Adam, you're the one, as far as I know, sitting at this table that's actually been in front of the actual image on the tilma. So what strikes you about that? Hey, I think, you know, it's just a, a beautiful image and it's uh, so different than um, anything that, you know, we're, we're used to seeing, um, just the colors and just, you know, there, there's so much imagery of the stars and the moon and how Our Lady really rises above all of it and that she is the, the queen of heaven and earth. And I think that really is, is something that's symbolized um, in Our Lady of Guadalupe. And it's something that, uh, you know, is just, you know, a great, I think, take on um, a culture of especially Mexico, but all of Latin America. She is the patroness of, of the America. So, I mean, there's always something that I think each one of us could take from it. That would be a great significance. But uh, there's just a, a lot of beauty, I think, all over um, the image. And it's something that I think um, we could really um, look at and just, you know, take apart, you know, piece by piece and just see the beauty of, of each really part of it and each uh, inch of it is, is really just something that's um, can only be made by a miracle. It's something that could only be made um, through that divine uh, uh, assistance, that divine help. So, Thank you. The one thing that I had read about her, her image was the colors that you're referencing that are on there and that no, there isn't anything in nature that could have created the colors that are on the tilma. Mm-hmm. No, to your point that yeah. only a miracle could do this. Yeah. And it just, you know, so many things that they've tested it and that they've done all these things to it. Um, and it's just how it even still exists on this Tilma um, is, is, is a miracle. But the ways that people have tried to destroy it or ruin mm-hmm. it, um, it hasn't changed it one bit and that it continues to live on and continues to um, really be that inspiration and that uh, great significance that, you know, 
we are united as a people, but we're united under our Blessed Mother who is watching over us and who mm-hmm. is protecting us. So I think it's just a great reminder for us. Mm-hmm. How about you, Star? Um, I think definitely the symbolism behind her image. There's so many like hidden symbols in there that mean that are so significant. Um, for me, I think it is the one where her hands are joining together. And if you look really closely enough, the two hands are different colors. So one is a, of a darker uh, skin tone and the other is of a lighter skin tone. So it's a merger of the indigenous community and the Spanish community mm-hmm. coming together. So, so it lines up to what Father Adam says mm-hmm. is that we're all Mm-hmm. under Our Lady's mantle. Absolutely. We are all her children, which is a beautiful way to envision our mother. And that's really who mm-hmm. Jesus gave us, is mm-hmm. her as our mother. Mm-hmm. So, Jose. The one thing that is my favorite thing about the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe is that when she presents herself to Juan Diego, she's actually with child, right? So that ribbon that she has tied around her waist sits kind of on the top of her her belly. Of her belly. Mm-hmm. So she's pregnant. And in Spanish, the word, there are a couple different words for um, for when a woman is pregnant. So there's embarazada, which is one that's used often, but there's also the word incinta. Mm-hmm. Um, and the word for ribbon is cinta. So she's in cinta, she's with child. So she has that ribbon tied around the top of her belly that kind of says um, to the people at that time that would know that, and say, oh, she's got a ribbon. She's with child. She is the mother of God. She is carrying, um, you know, uh, the son of God. So that really that really says something that for her to to kind of say, you know, ultimately still it is it's it's me that you see, but always with me or through me, you can come to my son. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Who is who is the main, you know, who, that that's who I bring you to. So even when she appears to them, she still comes with her son. Mm-hmm. He's just in her belly. belly. And I think that's like, and the fact, you know, we're in Advent and it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful mm-hmm. that the, this we get to celebrate this feast. Um, and she brought herself to us with preparation, right? She's, I'm pregnant with the Savior and that's awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. It's a nice way to think of her, mm-hmm. right? It's awesome the way it's she awesome. presents it. She, she's, yeah. So we had, we've had a number of conversations in our work together over the last couple of weeks and in, in this season of Advent, right? So we really wanted to, in such a time as this, that we wanted Advent, we all want Advent to feel like Advent. Mm-hmm. We wanted to come together. We still want to come together. We still want to keep each other safe. But thinking about those around us, those we know, those we don't know, those in our communities that are isolated, that are afraid, Mm -hmm. right? That are really suffering from great fear now. Let's talk a little bit around how Our Lady can play a role in the lives of each of us, but in particular, if you're suffering at this time. Mm -hmm. So Jose, you and I have been talking about this on an ongoing basis. So what do you, like thinking about this particular week, in which all of these things will happen. Mm -hmm. In the larger context of Advent, so we're talking St. Juan Diego, a man of great humility and how our mother comes to appear to him. What, if you could say something to someone who's suffering or who is lonely or who's afraid living during these times, what would you share with them about Our Lady? Uh, I mean, again, looking back at the story that Father Adam was was telling us about how uh, St. Juan Diego tried to avoid Right. He, he got scared. Right. Um, because he had to take care of his uncle who was ill. Um, so he stayed home. He stayed home. And I guess it, having a virtual Zoom meeting with our leader Guadalupe wasn't an option <laughs> at the time. Um, so in, he was worried. So he, he tried to avoid her. But it's what she says to him. It's again, it's that it's that one liner. It's that knockout punch. Um, you know, uh, basically, why are you worried? Why? What's concerning you? I'm your mother. Mm-hmm. And that's all you need to know. Right. So, oh, man, this this. So he loses his father early and his uncle's the man who raises him. And, you know, that'd be tough for anybody. And I and we see this now. I'm so concerned with so and so because they have 
they may have gotten COVID or I'm afraid because I might get COVID. But I think what she invites us is to remember that she's our mother and that we're protected under her mantle. Um, so come to her instead of getting and going around, right? Come back to her. And then, then that goes, you know, how brave are we to maybe step back into the church and see our brothers and sisters who are there and find her there and put mm -hmm. ourselves again at the foot of the cross? Um, granted, we have to be responsible. We've got to take the right measures and, and, and be safe. Um, but are we, are we, I think the contemplative question is, are we a bit like Juan Diego where we're trying to avoid it and go around it? Or is she calling us back and saying, I'm here? And what are you worried about? Mm -hmm. I got you. Mm -hmm. So I, I would sit on that one for a little bit and see, contemplate that question. Because it is really a part, it's a great part of the story is St. Juan Diego trying to go around the longer side of the mountain mm -hmm. to avoid Our Lady and what she was asking of him. So Father, let me ask you the question. In Again, similar question. In this time of Advent, to those who are suffering, what would you share with them about Our Lady? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it was great what Jose was saying about, you know, the, especially of, of trusting our Blessed Mother and knowing that she's here for us and that she's here uh, to care for us as her children. And, um, you know, as vocation director, I think I have a different take where, you know, I just see that the way that God chooses these people, chooses these messengers. And uh, how Juan Diego, who was just a humble man, was a simple man, um, but was chosen for this great mission um, where he was at. And that's where our Blessed Mother kind of met him, where he was at, spoke in his language, appeared to him in clothing that he would recognize. Um, mm -hmm. In the same, uh, you know, they call her uh, La uh, Moranita, right? mm -hmm. the little brown yeah. one. And, uh, you know, I was thinking of that when Star was saying about her grandmother talking to her like mm -hmm. like a friend, you know, yeah. like somebody who, who, who was part of their lives. Mm -hmm. And it's really seeing how God meets us where we're at. So while we might be, you know, homebound or we might be uh, scared to go out, we know that God is still working through us, that God is still calling us um, to stretch ourselves at times, to really go beyond uh, what might be holding us back or try to go uh, beyond what's holding us back. And we think of Juan Diego trying to approach this bishop who, you know, was definitely probably um, somebody uh, that was a, a, a figure that, could intimidate or, you know, right. without without trying to. But, you know, we just think of humble Juan Diego going to this big palace and just putting himself before him with this uh, suggestion uh, from the Blessed Mother, this really a, a request. But just how important it is to kind of, you know, know that God knows where we're at and he knows who we are, but he knows what we can be. And I think that's the, the great thing about Advent is while we're, we're waiting and while we're, you know, reflecting on the importance of Christ coming to us, um, we remember that he's here already and that he has given us so much um, and he continues to help us um, during this time to always see how we can make him um, visible to others. How can we be Christ to others? And it really is when we go out of our comfort zone, when we go out of those things that we're not used to doing um, that really kind of test us, but also allow us to see how God is working through us. Thank you. It's a beautiful reflection. And Star, I would ask you the question now, a little bit differently, especially yeah. because you do so much in young adult ministry here in the diocese, right? At your parish and you and Jose certainly doing Keeping It Catholic for yes. young millennials. Yes. What message would you have for young people, young adults, as it relates to Mary mm -hmm. in the context of Advent or in the context of having some anxiety? Mm -hmm. What would you want them to know mm -hmm. about Our Lady? Um, I think I would want them to know that whatever situation that someone may be going through, whatever you're going through right now, if you're suffering, if you're anxious of, over finals or if you're anxious over anything that you have going on in your life right now, that Our Lady is there as our mother for comfort, for support, um, to lean on her, to uh, share our struggles with her so that she can share that with Jesus. Um, so that we're able to just kind of get past that and let go of all of that burden. And also to um, realize that Mary, especially during this time of Advent, Advent, she is bringing us her son. 
and she is delivering her son to us um, soon. And despite all the chaos that maybe her and Joseph went through trying to leave and find a better place to, you know, to have Jesus, um, in that midst, they found peace. And, you know, they knew that it was all part of God's plan. And so whatever you're going through, whatever you have going on, know that Mama Mary is there, baby Jesus is there, and God is there for you all the time, and you're going to get through it. And look. I love that you call her Mama Mary. Yeah. <laughs> right, because I think all of us can come to these wonderful ideas of what we would call Our Lady. Mm -hmm. So for, for me, she's my little mighty mother. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I really need to chat with her, I'm like, little mighty mother, listen, <laughs> here's what I need to talk about now. You know, and I love that you just said Mama Mary. Mm -hmm. So we all have these beautiful terms of loving affection mm -hmm. for Our Lady because we know um, how much she loves us and none of us are alone and because she's always with us. So mm -hmm. this is a great period of Advent, of preparation, of mm -hmm. quiet, you know, of getting ourselves ready, maybe a little trip into the confession, right? We'll just plug a little confession, <laughs> sacrament of reconciliation, you know, if you can in this Advent season, just in order to allow this great work to occur during this Advent season so that when we wake up on Christmas, on mm -hmm. the feast and the nativity, we are changed and transformed and committed to baby Jesus. Yes. Just to arrive in that way. So let me ask this question. Do we have anything about St. Juan Diego or Our Lady of Guadalupe that we have not covered here tonight <laughs> that we think it's important for someone to know? Um, hmm. I don't think so. I think I did from, forget to mention that his uncle was healed. So that, oh, yeah, I'm thinking yeah, that was a good idea. Yeah, yeah, I kind of yeah. left that. Uh, but again, that's where the, mm -hmm. am I not your, your compassionate mother? Your yeah. mother loves you. Um, so I think, you know, Juan Diego just uh, is, is a great inspiration and a great model for us, especially um, for the laity as they take up their role. Mm -hmm. And in um, knowing that it's up to all of us to really um, proclaim the, mm -hmm. the gospel and to, to share that message of hope and that message of joy. And uh, Juan Diego, you know, really through this image, uh, changed that culture of death that he had experienced and really lived through all of his life um, into a place where, you know, millions were converted um, because of Our Lady, and she still does, you know, and I think that's really one of the miracles is how important Our Lady Guadalupe still is to so many causes, not just the pro-life cause or mm -hmm. to, you know, just representing Latino culture or Mexican culture, mm -hmm. um, but that she still plays such a significant part um, in our lives and that she still is bringing people to Christ and mm -hmm. still bringing people um, to the church. So I think, think that's a, a great, great example of really what we're called to do and um, what we're able to do with the help of God's grace. And that's, that's really it. Yeah, that's really beautiful. So on this feast of St. Juan Diego, he is a great role model to all of us mm -hmm. in his great humility and looking at the mission that she gave him. So the thing that I would leave everyone with is that each and every one of us has a mission. Each and every one of us has this call. God needs us each to do something for his kingdom. So with that, I will close this dinner and thank Star and Jose. We are in Jose's house. Star did all of the cooking. <laughs> Mike Walsh did the baking. And of course, John Kalitz is behind the camera. Yes. And we thank Father Adam for joining us, uh, especially because he had spent time in Mexico. He has been to the Basilica in Mexico. So you come with a great personal perspective. And so. I am Mexican. Right, yeah, and you are Mexican. <laughs> that's, about, that's about as true as starting with all the cooking. <laughs> wow. Wow, it's going to be hard for you after we all leave. Yeah. Yes, it just might be. <laughs> Star did do all the cooking, Jose. Star did, yeah. She did indeed. All right, thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining us around the dinner table. We hope that you are enriched and you've learned some new things about St. Juan Diego and your devotion to Our Lady does nothing but increase in this Advent season.